three of our seminar on dress, and today we're going to be talking uh, about modesty again, but this time we're going to be talking about modesty and behavior. So before we begin, let's start with a word of prayer. Dear Jesus, thank you for all the blessings that you've given to us. Thank you for this day. Please lead and guide our minds as we study your word. Help us to learn more about how we should act. And please lead and guide my mouth. Help me to say your words and draw us all closer to you and help us to be ready for heaven. Amen. Last time we ended with the uh, quote from the pastor who said that the most important issue in female modesty was a chaste heart and that uh, if you mandate modest clothing but people don't have a chaste heart, still the way a woman walks or conducts herself can cause a man to lust. So in the first uh, in the first presentation we talked about the we, how we need our heart changed and in this one uh, we're going to talk about the behavior. In the last one we talked about of course the clothing. So let's begin uh, in Timothy it if you remember, it said that women were to be in modest apparel, and it says also with shamefacedness and uh, sobriety. So if we look, uh, just to do a little review on what shamefacedness, shamefacedness is bashfulness or excess of modesty, and uh, bashfulness is excessive or extreme modesty. And sobriety was... Uh, habitual freedom from enthusiasm, calmness, coolness, seriousness, gravity without sadness or melancholy. So these words, what uh, shamefacedness and sobriety, what they mean. And last time we talked about this in dress, this time we're going to talk about this in behavior, because not only should the woman have it in her dress, she should also have it in her behavior. So, and we laid out the basic principle of modesty is that Christian modesty is look at God, not at me. And immodesty is look at me, not at God. So that was the basis of modesty. If you sum everything up, what modesty means. It's look at God, not at me. So we applied that to our dress, and today we're going to apply this principle to our behavior. Our behavior should say, look at God, not at me. Christians should not be trying to draw attention to themselves and how they act. Now, when we talk about how we're to relate to the opposite gender, how we're to act around the opposite gender, we need to not only remember not to do things that are wrong, obviously, but we should also be careful not to give the appearance that we're doing things that are wrong. 1 Thessalonians 5.22 said, abstain from all appearance of evil. So we should be careful not to give the appearance of evil. Now Matthew Henry's commentary on this verse says, we should therefore abstain from evil and all appearances of evil. From sin and that which looks like sin leads to it and borders upon it. He who is not shy of the appearances of sin, who shuns not the occasions of sin, and who avoids not the temptations and approaches to sin, will not long abstain from the actual commission of sin. So he's saying we should be careful to abstain from what looks like uh, evil, what looks like sin, what leads to sin, and what borders upon it. Sometimes we'll come across things that we think, is this right, is this wrong? It seems like what we class as a gray area. And if it is a gray area, then we should avoid it because gray area has some black mixed in. And if we start getting too close to the edge, then we might go over into real sin. So we should stay away not just from sin, but we should have boundaries to avoid getting close to sin. Okay, reasons for modesty in behavior. There are several reasons to be modest in our behavior as Christians. One is it helps to protect from unwanted attention from the opposite sex. So it helps uh, keep 
keep us from getting attention from those of the opposite gender that we don't want. And it will also help to protect from rumors being started. You know, sometimes we might do things that we think are innocent in and of themselves, but uh, the people around us don't think we have innocent intentions with that. And that could lead to rumors being started. Sometimes people's reputations have uh, been totally destroyed on the basis that they did something that they thought was innocent, but it started rumors. So being modest in your behavior, being careful how you relate to the opposite gender will help to protect from rumors being started. And it will also protect your heart from going in the wrong direction. So it will, uh, putting boundaries in place that you are modest in your behavior will help to protect also your heart. Now in Timothy, uh, 1 Timothy 5, Paul gives Timothy counsel as how he's to relate to other people in the church. And he says, Rebuke not an elder, but entreat him as a father, and the younger men as brethren, the elder women as mothers, the younger as sisters, with all purity. So Paul counseled Timothy that in the Christian church, uh, though everyone is to be spiritual family, there is a specification that when it comes to relating to the opposite gender, though he was to treat the older women as mothers and the younger women as sisters, it was with all purity. There are some things that you may be able to do with a biological family member that you could not do with someone that's your spiritual family member. For example, a person cannot marry their biological sister or their biological brother but a person can marry their uh, brother or sister in Christ. So, though we as Christians are all part of a spiritual family, there should still be boundaries uh, in place when it comes to relating to other Christians and to people in general. If we go to 1 Peter 3, we find out that modest behavior is a requirement. Peter said, Likewise, you wives, be in subjection to your own husbands, that if any obey not the word, they also may, without the word, be won by the conversation of wives. Well, they behold your chaste conversation coupled with fear. So Peter here, he counseled wives that they are to be in subjection to their own husbands, and he says uh, that the husbands that are not converted, he said they can be won by the behavior of the wives. And he specified what kinds of behavior they should have. He says they, the husband should be seeing the Christian women uh, exhibiting chaste conversation, chaste behavior. Now, just to show the conversation, because today we oftentimes use it in regard to talking, but in the Bible, conversation means manner of life, conduct, behavior, or deportment. So the conversation is how you act, how you live your life, how you conduct yourself. And the uh, word chaste, it uh, has to do with purity. The second definition is free from obscenity, which it says is actually what it means in this verse. And the word obscenity uh, means impurity in expression or representation, that quality in words or things which presents what is offensive to chastity or purity of mind, ribaldry, unchaste actions or lewdness. So obscenity is basically impurity and impure actions. So chaste conversation is would be pure behavior. Your behavior does not have anything immoral in it or anything that lends to uh, immoral behavior. Again, we can see chaste also um, in the KJV New Testament Greek lexicon, also says it means pure. And it also gives the word modest as another definition of it. 
So Peter is not the only one that tells Christians that they should, uh, Christian women, that they should be chaste. In Titus 2, we read, uh, there's a whole description talking to each different class of people. First it addresses the older men, then it addresses the older women, then it addresses the younger women, then it addresses the young men, and telling them what characteristics they should have. Now, and the older women and the younger women actually overlap because the older women are told to be teachers of good things, and then it tells them what they're to teach the young women. So obviously to be teachers of uh, these things, they would have to practice them themselves. So it says uh, that the, what they're to teach the young women, that they may teach the young women to be sober, to love their husbands, to love their children, to be discreet, chaste, keepers at home, good, obedient to their own husbands, that the word of God be not blasphemed. So this was to protect the word of God from being blasphemed by the Gentiles. And it tells women what they're supposed to be like. And it lists the word chaste in here. They're to be chaste. But at the same time, right before chaste, it also mentions that they should be discreet. Now, what does discreet mean? Uh, discreet or discretion is very important in the Bible. We read in Proverbs 11:22, as a jewel of gold in a swine snout, so is a fair woman, which is without discretion. So the Bible doesn't talk positively about uh, those that don't have discretion. It says a woman without discretion is like a jewel of gold in a pig's nose. So it's not positive how it talks about someone that doesn't have discretion. But what is discretion? Discretion uh, is prudence or knowledge and prudence. It says, that discernment which enables a person to judge critically of what is correct and proper, united with caution, nice discernment and judgment, directed by circumspection and primarily regarding one's own conduct. So we could say dis uh, discretion is having the discernment or knowledge to know what is proper and what is improper, especially regarding your behavior how you conduct yourself. Now, what are we to do with immoral practices? Are we to go as close to the uh, line as we can, or are we to stay far away? In 2 Timothy 2.22, we find the answer. Paul told Timothy, he said, Flee also youthful lust, but follow righteousness, faith, charity, peace, with them that call on the Lord out of a pure heart. So Paul told Timothy to flee youthful lust. Things that are uh, regarding what is appropriate, what is inappropriate, and things regarding moral behavior, we should uh, flee the dangerous side of things. We should not try to see how close we can get. We're going to move on to the fruit of the Spirit in Galatians 5, 22 and 23. It says that the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance, against such there is no law. So the fruit of the Spirit is what Christians are supposed to be showing in their lives. And the first fruit of the Spirit is love. This is one of the most important characteristics Christians should have in their lives. But before Paul talked about the fruit of the Spirit in Galatians 5, he talked about the works of the flesh. And it's actually interesting that the four first works of the flesh that he mentioned are actually counterfeits for love. In the works of the flesh, the first four mentioned is adultery, fornication, uncleanness, and lasciviousness. And Paul said at the end of giving the works of the flesh, he says, They which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. So Paul says all these things, and he says those that do these things will not be saved. They will not inherit the kingdom of God. But the first four are the devil's counterfeit for God's love. We see adultery fornication, uncleanness, and lasciviousness. Now, 
Most of us have probably heard the word adultery used, uh, cheating on one's spouse, or fornication, which would include those that are unmarried, uh, doing things that they should not be doing until they're married. Uncleanness, if you study it in the Bible, it takes in basically all the other sexual sins, uh, things like homosexuality, bestiality, and incest would be included under uncleanness. But lasciviousness uh, is a big word. We talked a little bit about it last time and what it can mean. We're going to go more in depth into how, what it can mean and how it can relate to our behavior. Okay, we read this definition last time from Webster's 1828 Dictionary that lasciviousness, uh, one of its definitions is tendency to excite lust and promote irregular indulgences. So lasciviousness is things that excite lust. It's things that can make us lust or make someone else lust. But we're going to go more in depth. If you read different commentators, views on this. Adam Clark said what that lasciviousness, the definition, is whatever is contrary to chastity or to purity, all lewdness. So he's saying lasciviousness is anything that is not pure. John Wesley said the Greek word means in, anything inward or outward that is contrary to chastity or purity and yet short of actual uncleanness. So John Wesley says that the Greek word is anything that is inside or outside, but is going contrary to purity. But it's not yet to the point of uncleanness. So it's not, it doesn't include the actual actions that we would class as the sexual sins. It's things that lead up to that. Things in your thoughts, things in your actions, or your dress, it's things that lead up to the actual, uh, what we would class as the sin. And uh, John Gill says it's all lustful dalliance or all lustful acts of fondness, everything that leads on to acts of uncleanness or attends them as impure words, filthy gestures, and the like. So you can see basically everyone agrees that lasciviousness is the things that lead to the uh, committing of fornication or uncleanness or adultery. It's anything in, that is not pure and holy but that leads in that direction. So he uses the example of impure words or anything we would uh, do that is not pure. Okay, here is someone putting lasciviousness, giving some suggestions of what it would be like modernly. They say lasciviousness occurs frequently in workplaces where men and women are constantly thrown together in close contact. And here they list some modern things that we could class under lasciviousness. Flirting, suggestive touching, sexual innuendo, sex humor, provocative dress, skin tight apparel, the display of cleavage, thigh refilling skirts, etc. are forms of lascivious conduct that very often lead to fornication and adultery. The tempter as well as the temptee are guilty. So all these different things they're saying uh, are part of lasciviousness. It's things that are leading in the direction of going down the wrong road. So you can see that the dress, uh, like we talked about last time, is mentioned, but you can also see things like flirting and suggestive touching or sexual insinuations, things like dirty jokes, all are part of lasciviousness. If we go to Thayer's Greek uh, English lexicon, it says lasciviousness, the Greek word there means wanton acts or manners as filthy words, indecent bodily movements, unchaste handling of males and females, etc. So you can see here that it includes a lot of things in behavior that are not pure, that are contrary to purity. It includes indecent bodily movements and unchaste handling of males and females. So touching that is not appropriate. And we could see from this definition that uh, dancing would fall under this because modern dancing, either you have a male and female touching each other, 
that it is not appropriate. It would be unchaste handling of males and females. Or even if it's single dancing, uh, oftentimes the body is being moved indecently. A lot of times it's the pelvic area that is being moved, which is not appropriate. This quote uh, shows the connection between dancing and lasciviousness. It says, as a footnote to this brief analysis of lasciviousness, we should note that dancing as it is engaged in today is without doubt lasciviousness. It contains indecent bodily movements, provides for the unchaste handling of males and females. And then they quote, I will say that I do believe a woman cannot waltz virtuously and waltz well, for she must yield her person completely to her partner. And that was a quote from Professor Harry Stribes, who was a renowned champion dancer. So uh, someone in the industry of dancing said that a woman cannot dance well and dance virtuously. She cannot be a virtuous woman and dance because the two don't go together. But the, continuing their quote, they say it provides for the unchaste handling of males and females and tends toward that which is lewd, producing lustful thoughts and evil desires. And then they give another quote, there is left but one reason for the popularity of the dance and that is sex appeal. I hasten to assure you that I do not believe the dancers are always conscious that this is the reason they enjoy the position and the steps that go with it. But this lack of consciousness is merely an added factor of danger. And that was a quote from a man who was a former owner and operator of one of Chicago's largest dance halls. So another man in the dance industry says that one of the reasons for the popularity of dance is its sex appeal. He says whether or not the dancers are conscious of that, but if they're not conscious of that, that's one of the reasons that it is dangerous. So we can see that dancing would not be uh, appropriate behavior for a Christian to engage in because it's not appropriate touching of men and women. And even if you're dancing by yourself, it is inappropriate movements that you are performing with your body. Hastings, Bible Diction or Hastings Dictionary of the Bible says that for the word lasciviousness, that the idea idea of the Greek word is shameless conduct of any kind. Shameless is destitute of shame or wanting modesty. But he's saying that lasciviousness is shameless conduct. It's immodest conduct and it's something performed with no shame. Now we can see a lot of that in the world today. Most things that fall under lasciviousness are things people do without even shame today. If you went back a hundred years, or 200 years, um, they would not be allowed. But today they're done without any shame. No one even blushes at things that are immodest behavior. So we could sum up lasciviousness. There's anything in words, behavior, dress, etc., that promotes and excites lustful behavior or thoughts. So it's anything that is promoting or exciting lustful behavior, or even the thoughts of it. And all the other sins, sexual sins, adultery, fornication, and uncleanness, are the fruits that grow out of the root of lasciviousness. So before you get to adultery or fornication or uncleanness, you started in lasciviousness. That is the root. And Jesus always dealt with the root uh, problem. So if we would uh, follow his example, we have to get to the root. So if we want to put a stop to the sins of adultery, fornication, and uncleanness, then we need to get rid of lasciviousness out of our lives. Okay, one of the quotes you remember that put into modern words talked about flirting being a part of lasciviousness. What is flirting? This is from Wikipedia. They say flirting is a social and sexual behavior involving spoken or written communication as well as body language by one person to another, 
either to suggest interest in a deeper relationship with the other person or if done playfully for amusement. So flirting is classed as a social and a sexual behavior and it is used by people to either suggest that they want a deeper relationship with the other person, so they want to move more intimate, or some people do it playfully for amusement, but it is still classed as a sexual behavior. It says in most cultures it is socially disapproved for a person to make explicit sexual advances in public or in private to someone not romantically acquainted, but indirect or suggestive advances may at times be considered acceptable. So basically flirting is not something that is a blatant sexual advance, it's something that's more indirect or suggestive because the blatant ones are not considered acceptable in most cultures. Flirting usually involves speaking and behaving in a way that suggests a mildly greater intimacy than the actual relationship between the parties would justify, though within the rules of social etiquette which generally disapproves of a direct expression of sexual interest in the giving setting. This may be accomplished by communicating a sense of playfulness or irony. So flirting is basically uh, speaking how you talk or how you behave in a way that suggests that you want uh, to go deeper in the relationship like we already said, but it is done within what is classed as appropriate. So flirting is basically trying to show interest in the person without crossing any cultural boundaries of what is appropriate or inappropriate. So it's going to take advantages of where culture has allowed, uh, has allowed the line between what is appropriate and inappropriate to be gray. Now flirting was probably what was done by Isaac, we see in Genesis 26 uh, that it says Isaac dwelt in Gerar and the men of the place asked him of his wife and he said she is my sister for he feared to say she is my wife lest said he the men of the place should kill me for Rebekah because she was fair to look upon and it came to pass when he had been there a long time that Abimelech king of the Philistines looked out at a window and saw and behold Isaac was sporting with Rebekah his wife. And Abimelech called Isaac and said, Behold of a surety she is thy wife, and how saidst thou she is my sister? And Isaac said unto him, Because I said, Lest I die for her. So this, it was, was probably some sort of flirtatious behavior that Isaac was engaging in with Rebekah. And it showed Abimelech that she was not his sister, rather there was, she was his wife, there was romantic interest. The word that is translated sporting there means to laugh outright in merry men or scorn by implication to sport, laugh, mock, play, make sport. So this was some sort of uh, entertaining flirtatious behavior that Isaac was engaging in. And it showed to those around what relation Rebecca was to him. Because I'm sure knowing that he was a godly man, Abimelech, would know that he's not going to do anything inappropriate with another woman. If we go to Ephesians 5, 3 and 4, it says, But fornication, all uncleanness or covetousness, let it not be once named among you as become as saints, neither filthiness, nor foolish talking, nor jesting, which are not convenient, but rather giving of thanks. Now, the Bible speaks against jesting, or in modern terms we call it joking because obviously you have the blatant where you have dirty jokes, jokes that are made about sexual things that are not appropriate for Christians. But at the same time, you also have things that are, would be considered bad or inappropriate if they were done in a serious manner or allowed when they're done in a joking manner. Like the, for example, the picture here, how this woman is behaving with this man which you can say is if he's not her husband, how she's behaving would be classed as inappropriate. But as soon as she uh, says she's just joking, she's just playing around, in today's society, many people go, okay, well, it's fine. But the Bible speaks against joking or jesting. If something is not appropriate, 
it's not appropriate even if it's done in a funny, playful manner. If it would not be appropriate, if it was serious, it's not appropriate if it's done in a funny way. Okay, we're going to go through the Bible, studying a little bit of what it says with the harlot's behavior. Now in the Bible, it talks a lot about the harlot in relation to the woman. And because modesty is oftentimes a big issue with the woman, we're gonna be talking about the woman too, but these principles also go for the men. And they should also be careful how they behave. So we're gonna look in Proverbs, and in Proverbs 23, it tells us that a whore is a deep ditch and a strange woman is a narrow pit. She also lieth in wait as for a prey and increaseth the transgressors among men. So this principle of lying in wait is for the prey we can see um, in this modesty issue because if we look at like the lion, for example, or any other animal that preys upon other animals, a lot of times they will go to where the animal's natural instincts will draw it and there they will catch their prey. For example, the lion will go to the water hole because it knows that the animals have to come get a drink. Their natural instincts will bring them to get water. And it's taking advantage of those natural instincts uh, to catch its prey. And same with harlot or strange woman or someone that's immoral. The things they are doing are taking advantage of the natural instincts. For example, in modest dress, on a woman is taking advantage of the fact that a man is visually stimulated. He's very visual and they, by dressing immodestly, they're taking advantage of his natural instincts in the visual realm. But you could take it the other way. Uh, the, the man is very visual. The woman is a lot of times very emotionally oriented and you'll see a lot of times uh, males that have bad intentions that they want to get a woman, they will take advantage of her emotions. They will get a hold of her emotions so they can get to her and get what they want. So those that uh, are engaging in immoral behavior, they're lying in wait as for a prey. They're using things that take advantage of the natural instincts. And they might be doing this knowingly or unknowingly, but they're still doing it. Now, there are, is a class of people that do not realize that what they're doing is wrong. If you go to Proverbs 30, it says about the adulterous woman, it says, There be three things that are too wonderful for me, yea, four which I know not, the way of an eagle in the air, the way of a serpent upon a rock, the way of a ship in the midst of the sea, and the way of a man with a maid. Such is the way of an adulterous woman. She eateth and wipeth her mouth and saith, I have done no wickedness. So here is an adulterous woman that she's doing what's wrong, but she's saying, I haven't done anything that's wrong. And so there is a class of people. There are people that are denying the fact that they, what they're doing is wrong, that what the way they dress could have be a problem or the way they act could be a problem. But there are also people that legitimately think that it can't be a problem. Just because you think it's not wrong does not mean it's not wrong. Okay, we're going to go through Proverbs 7 because this chapter gives us kind of a description of a harlot's behavior. So basically we have a description of what is not appropriate behavior. And uh, again, this is dealing with a woman, but many of these principles also will apply to men. If we start reading... Uh, it says, Behold, there met him a woman with the attire of a harlot and subtle of heart. She is loud and stubborn. Her feet abide not in her house. Now she is without, now in the streets, and lieth in wait at every corner. So this uh, harlot or adulterous woman, she comes out to meet the guy and says she's in the attire of a harlot, which we talked about last time with the clothing of a harlot. Says she's subtle of heart, she's loud and stubborn, and her feet do not abide in her house. 
The Bishop's Bible from 1568 says there met him a woman with the open tokens of a harlot, only her heart was hit. So in other words, she looked like a harlot on the outside, but she kind of concealed what was actually in her heart, except by looking at the outside, you can tell a lot. But now we're going to go through these things that are a harlot's behavior. Okay, what we can see in this chapter, these are just some of the points I pulled out of the chapter, but you can study it and see even more. It says she's loud and stubborn. Her feet abide not at her house. She's overly friendly uh, with other men that are not her husband. She flatters. She's trying to impress a man that's not her husband. And she's keeping secrets from her husband. So we're going to go through these things. First, we can look at loud and stubborn. In Proverbs 9, 13, it says, A foolish woman is clamorous. She is simple and knoweth nothing. So it says, and the word clamorous means uh, speaking and repeating loud words, noisy. Uh, and it can also mean loud. So it says the foolish woman is clamorous. So in several places in Proverbs, when talking about an immoral and bad woman, it classes her as being loud. She's trying to draw attention to herself. She's not uh, being meek and humble. Now, if we contrast with the uh, evil woman in Proverbs, if we contrast with a godly woman, as seen in the New Testament, in Peter it says that the woman, a godly woman, is to have the ornament of a meek and quiet spirit, which is in the sight of God a great price. So the godly woman is to be humble and quiet. It's not that she won't speak up for God, but her whole mannerism, she should be meek and quiet, not trying to draw attention to herself like the harlot in Proverbs. And you can see that this uh, characteristic is emphasized in both Peter and Timothy after um, the woman's dress has been talked about. It talks about this characteristic of the woman and how she should have it. This is what Peter said that she used to have a meek and quiet spirit. In Timothy, after discussing the woman's dress, it says, Let the woman learn in silence with all subjection, but I suffer not a woman to teach nor to usurp authority over the man, but to be in silence. Now, the word there, usurp authority, is to dominate, govern, or exercise dominion over one. So in both places, after the dress, of a Christian woman is discussed that she should be modest in her dress, then it talks about how she should be modest in her behavior. She's not to be uh, loud and uh, controlling over a man. She's to be humble and meek. That is the place of a Christian woman. Now you can see in the world today, unfortunately, the world teaches what is uh, a woman is supposed to be like. Uh, the world is leaning more toward teaching a woman to be like what is described in Proverbs, rather than teaching a woman to be what a Christian woman is supposed to be like. If we go further on in uh, Peter, it says... After this manner, in the old time, the holy women also who trusted in God adorned themselves, being in subjection unto their own husbands, even as Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord, whose daughters ye are, as long as ye do well, and are not afraid with any amazement. Likewise ye husbands dwell with them according to knowledge, giving honor unto the wife as unto the weaker vessel, and as being heirs together of the grace of life, that your prayers be not hindered. So it talks about the dress of the woman, then it talks about how she's to have the ornament of the meek and quiet spirit, and it says that in old time, the holy women had this meek and quiet spirit, and they were in subjection unto their own husbands. It uses the example of Sarah obeying Abraham and calling him Lord. Now that's a respectful title showing the uh, respect that the holy women had for their husbands. And for men in general, godly men, they 
man was put uh, as the head over the woman, and the woman were to be meek and quiet. Now, though the uh, principle of being meek and quiet is specifically addressed to women, being gentle and uh, humble and not drawing attention to yourself by your words is something that all Christians should learn from. It says, Wherefore, my beloved brethren, let every man be swift to hear, slow to speak, and slow to wrath. So you can see the Christian attitude is to be swift to hear and slow to speak, to be quick to hear and not so quick to speak. Now, we should always be ready to give an answer for our faith. Uh, even women should be ready to give answers and to teach what they believe. But we should, when we're working with people and dealing with people, we should be humble enough that we do not consider ourselves the most important, that we are willing to hear what they have to say, and we are not easily angered. We're patient with them. Okay, the next thing it talked about, it says that the woman, her feet abide not at her house. Now, like we said already, uh, society today is teaching women to be more like the woman in Proverbs. Loud, stubborn, not in subjection to their husbands, not respectful of the men, and teaching them to not be homemakers. Uh, whereas it says the woman in Proverbs 7, she, her feet abide not at her house. In Titus 2, where it talks about Christian women, it says they're to be keepers at home. Now, we're discussing uh, specifically moral behavior, so how does this relate into moral behavior? It's of interest that as uh, we've had more women move into the workplace, now men and women that are not married are often off to themselves, and it is creating a very immoral society. The statistics say more than 60% of affairs begin at the workplace. And some sources say it is as much as 85% of affairs. So between 60 and 85% of marital affairs where one spouse is cheating on another spouse, those begin at the workplace. In fact, it is said the workplace is the number one place for people to meet the other person. So basically, as society has pushed more women into the workforce and they're less keepers at home, they're more in the workplace, the rate of immoral behavior and uh, marital unfaithfulness is going up. Now, there obviously are times when a woman has to work outside the home. Maybe she's a single mother or maybe for some other reason she needs to work outside the home, but it is dangerous ground. And if it is necessary, for some reason there needs to be other boundaries put in place to ensure that you do not go over the line. You do not want to be guilty of affair starting. But it's not just where the woman is or physically or where the man is physically. Because next to the workplace being the number one place for people to meet the other person to have an affair, if someone has left, their feet might still be in their home, but they have in heart left their home through being online. They might still be at home, but they're not actually doing the work of a homekeeper. They're off online. Uh, it can also be dangerous. So it is very important that the heart be in the home. The online cheating, uh, this quote says, in many counties, as much as 75% of divorce cases report the words Facebook and opposite sex in the proceedings. So this is 75% of divorce cases are related to online problems. The fact that the people were cheating online. It says what is documented is that trivial and mundane topics that were discussed when a conversation began on Facebook quick, quickly transitioned to marital woes and hardships and then we're taken even further. 
Emotional confiding steadily occurred, dissatisfaction with spouses was a prime topic, and eventually the conversations included sexual dialogue. So it shows, this is talking about online cheating, but that conversations begin on ordinary topics, then they transition over to talking about marital problems. That is where they cross the line that shouldn't be crossed because marital problems should be kept within the marriage if you want it to remain a happy marriage. So, but this, this was dealing with online cheating. This would go for any cheating. The same with in the workplace. If a man and a woman start discussing uh, problems with their marriage, it can very quickly lead over into other things. So the heart should abide in the home, even if you're not allowed or you're not able for some reason for your feet to be in the home, your heart should be in the home. This is uh, going on with the online cheating. It says sexual infidelity means you need to have sexual contact with a person who is not your partner. And emotional infidelity means that you're confiding in and emotionally connecting with a person outside of your relationship without the sex, she says. We're dealing with a whole new category here. Dr. Berman has named sexting, social media, and email flirting phenomenon, cyber infidelity. Stacy Kayser, a licensed psychotherapist, relationship columnist for USA Today, and author of How to Be a Grown-Up, refers to it as a virtual affair. So you can see here they list three different types of infidelity. Sexual infidelity, which is what is most recognized, Emotional infidelity, where you're confiding in and you're emotionally connecting. This is uh, where a lot of women stumble a lot of times because they, a man besides their husband is fulfilling their emotional needs. And then cyber infidelity, where you're flirting and stuff over uh, media. Okay. If we go on, we see in Proverbs 7, 13, and 14, it says, So she caught him and kissed him, and with an impudent face said unto him, I have peace offerings with me. This day have I paid my vows. So here we can see uh, the woman is overly friendly in her behavior with other men. So overly friendly behavior with the opposite gender would be wrong. You don't want to be known for being a girl that catches guys or a guy that catches girls. Now the word caught here means to fasten upon, hence to seize. So you can see it takes with it uh, the meaning of fastening to. Now if we go to 1 Corinthians 7.1, it says, now concerning the things whereof you wrote unto me, it is good for a man not to touch a woman. Now this word touch in the Greek means to fasten oneself to. So it uh, has a direct connection to how in the Greek to the Hebrew word used for where she caught uh, this man. And here we can see adultery can start with just touching. Now, some people would say that this touch is specific to uh, having an intimate relationship and would be equivalent to where we would say they slept with the person. But the word here used means touch. It means to fasten oneself to it here, to cling to. And anybody that is... Uh, Anybody that is honest with themselves will recognize that adultery can start with uh, touching and seeing how far you can go. My husband actually uh, was talking to a group of people and was talking about this issue with touching and how people start touching and uh, touch the arm, they'll touch, and then they try to get closer and closer just to see how far they can go. And as he's talking about this and how we should not, we should draw the line where we do not uh, start 
on this touching to see how far we can go. Everyone started laughing, uh, kind of sheepishly laughing. And he asked why everyone's laughing. And they said, uh, they said that it's true what he's saying. They all recognize uh, that they have been there or seen people that have been there, that they start on the simply touching just to see how, how personal the touch can get. So we should draw the line uh, where we are careful even on the touching issue. I'm not saying that you can't greet someone with a handshake and uh, I'm not saying that you can't offer a hand if someone falls and they need help out of a hole or something. I'm not, don't take my words to be uh, what they're not meant to be. I'm talking about people that start touching, they have intentions or you can start on the touching thing, maybe not having intentions, but other people may use your example and copy it and they do have intentions. We see in the Bible that touching is not always appropriate. In Ecclesiastes 3.5, it says there's a time to, it goes through telling there's a time for this and there's a time for that. Everything has a time. It says a time to embrace and a time to refrain from embracing. So obviously a time to embrace uh, your spouse or even a close family member, a brother, sister, or mother. Uh, there's a time to embrace, but it says there's a time to refrain from embracing. So there are uh, obviously times where touching is not appropriate according to the Bible. And in Proverbs, it tells us uh, when we should be careful of close touching. It talks about, uh, let thy fountain be, be blessed and rejoice with the wife of thy youth. Let her be as the loving hind in a pleasant row. Let her breast satisfy thee at all times, and be thou ravished always with her love. And why wilt thou, my son, be ravished with a strange woman and embrace the bosom of a stranger? So here it gives an example of inappropriate touching. It's with a strange woman, someone that is not the wife. Okay, if we move on, the uh, another characteristic of the harlot is flattery. And flattery is very commonly used when you're flirting with someone. In Proverbs 7.21, it says, With her much fair speech, she caused him to yield. With the flattering of her lips, she forced him. So it says that with her flattery, she forced him. She's basically manipulating him by flattering him. The word force is actually used seven times in the King James, and four of those times it actually directly refers to rape. So you can see forcing someone is not kind. But here it says that through flattery, she is forcing the man. Now, what is flattery? Flattery is false praise commendation bestowed for the purpose of gaining favor and influence or to accomplish some purpose. Direct flattery consists in praising a person himself. Indirect consists in praising a person through his works or his connections. It can also mean adulation, which is praise in excess. Uh, so flattery is either false praise, so it's compliments and praising someone that is not true, or it can be praise in excess. So you're, uh, even if there is a basis of truth, you're going overboard with complimenting them. Now the example of flattery given in Proverbs 7, she says, I have peace offerings with me. This day have I paid my vows. Therefore came I forth to meet thee, diligently to seek thy face, and I have found thee. I have decked my bed with coverings of tapestry, with carved works, with fine linen of Egypt. I have perfumed my bed with myrrh, aloes, and cinnamon. Come, let us take our fill of love until the morning. Let us solace ourselves with loves. For the good man is not at home. He has gone a long journey. He hath taken a bag of money with him and will come home at the day appointed. So here she says, uh, she's basically making him feel super special. She has done all this for him. And she was seeking diligently for him. 
and she finally found him. So she makes him feel very super special. And also you might say she also makes him feel a little bit indebted to her, like if he refuses uh, her advances it could be used against him, that she did all this for him and then he's not taking her advances. Uh, it's kind of like a girl that might refuse uh, the advances of a man. He's bought her all kinds of special things, but then she realizes that he wants things she doesn't want to give, and so she refuses, and then he makes her sound bad because he did all this for her and she's ungrateful. But you can see flattery. She's making a man that's not her husband feel super special. I like the way this person commented on it. They said, the seductress makes you feel so special. She uses the word you three times in one sentence. I feel a little uncomfortable anytime someone tries to make me think I'm special. When you're on a business trip and a woman takes a special interest in you and what you do, my advice is to run for the hills. None of us are that special. You have a life. You may be married and have kids. You don't need a strange woman telling you how special you are. She will make you feel that you are special, smart, handsome, and appreciated. Remember, if a woman who is not your wife or fiancé is trying to convince you that you are special, you are being warmed up to be fried, no matter who she is. So, I like the way that they say it. Basically, nobody should be making you feel that you are super special, unless it would be your spouse. Flattery is not kind. Proverbs 29 says, A man that flattereth his neighbor spreadeth a net for his feet. So flattering someone, you are spreading a net for their feet. You're basically setting a trap for them, whether you mean to or not. Uh, basically, we could say that flattery is uh, with anyone other than your lover other than your spouse, it's acting in a way that expresses attraction or seeks attention. And this person says on it that they say that doing that with anyone other than your spouse is wrong. And they give an example of someone that uh, showed attraction to someone, not necessarily even meaning it, but it caused marital problems. So you take Ali as an example. She's a bubbly woman with witticisms to spare who's married Peter, a handsome, spiritual, but not so slapstick man. Early in marriage, Ali laughed till she cried at single man Jerry's jokes during their group Bible study. Until one night, Peter privately voiced an uncharacteristically sarcastic and obviously pained, have fun with your boyfriend tonight? How did Ali respond? Rather than trying to change Peter, she changed her actions and her type to align with her lover. She curbed her giggling from ever again being a pat on a funny man's back and a slap in her husband's face. So, uh, flattery and uh, expressing attraction to someone could take very subtle uh, appearances, as in the case with this woman that simply the fact that she was laughing a lot at another man caused her husband to feel uncomfortable. Okay, the last thing that we talked about the woman having is that she's keeping secrets from her husband. She, when she invites the guy to her home, she specifies that the good man, or her husband, is not at home, that he's gone on a long journey and that he will come home at the day appointed. So she's going behind her husband's back. Her husband has gone on a long trip, probably a business trip, and she's taking advantage, advantage of that and she's bringing another guy into her home so that they can do things while her husband is gone. But the principle here is she's keeping secrets from her husband. Keeping secrets with someone of the opposite gender that is not your spouse is not right. If you are young and unmarried, you should not be keeping secrets with someone of the opposite gender that you would not want your parents or some uh, respected spiritual uh, person in the church to know about. 
And if you are married, you should not be saying anything to someone of the opposite gender that uh, is not your spouse, that you would be uncomfortable with your spouse finding out about. If you are keeping secrets, you are on dangerous ground. Now you see, not only is she keeping secrets, she's also inviting the man into her home when her husband is gone. Now, the Bible teaches that being alone with the opposite gender can be dangerous. We see in 2 Samuel 13 um, that Tamar went to her brother Ammon's house. And uh, if you're familiar with the story, you know that he was sick. He called for her to come to give him food. Uh, and so she goes to give him food. But he, it says, and Ammon said, have out all the men from me. And they went out every man from him. So Ammon has bad intentions. We see that in the story. And the, one of the first things he does is he wants everyone else out. He wants her one-on-one -on -one because he has bad intentions. Then we read on that, she, that he had her come into his bedroom and that she took the cakes which she had made, brought them into the chamber to Ammon, her brother. And when she had brought them unto him to eat, he took hold of her and said, come lie with me, my sister. And we know the story she refused and so he forced her and raped her. So we can see that someone that had bad intentions, uh, the first thing they want to do is get the person one-on-one -on -one without anyone else there. So the Bible teaches being alone is dangerous. If it's with the person of the opposite uh, gender, it is better to always have a third party or even a whole group present. And if you do not have bad intentions, then you shouldn't mind having other people present. We can see, now that was dealing with a case where uh, a woman was taken advantage of because she was alone with a man. But we can see it can also go the other way. In Genesis 39, we have the story of Joseph. And we all know the story that Joseph's uh, employer's uh, wife took a liking to him. And it says, it came to pass as she spake to Joseph day by day that he hearkened not unto her to lie by her or to be with her. So Joseph started taking precautions. Not only would he not do what she asked, he would not sleep with her. He also tried not to be with her. He tried to avoid her. But it says, it came to pass about this time that Joseph went into the house to do his business. And there was none of the men of the house there within. And she caught him by his garment, saying, Lie with me. And he left his garment in her hand and fled and got him out. So he went in. We don't know exactly why there were no other men in the house at that time. Uh, Jewish tradition says that it was a holiday, and so everyone was supposed to have gone to the holiday, except for Joseph being a Hebrew, didn't participate in the idolatrous holidays. But the woman had... Uh, made up a story that she was sick so she could stay home. So he didn't expect her there. We don't know whether that's the case or not, but whatever the case was, for some reason there was no one else there. She caught him. Again, you see this thing of she's uh, catching him. She's a woman that's catching guys. And she caught him and tried to get him to sleep with her. He refused, and we know the rest of the story. He was falsely accused. Even though he had not done anything wrong, his uh, reputation went under fire for it. So we can see from the Bible that being alone with the opposite gender is dangerous. It is better to always have a third party present. And um, in regard to keeping secrets with the opposite gender, when we look at Jesus, who is our example, he was uh, when he was questioned as to what he taught, he said, I spake openly to the world. I ever taught in the synagogue, in the temple, whither the Jews always resort. And in secret have I said nothing. He says, why askest thou me? Ask them which heard me. So Jesus, when he was on trial for his doctrine he was teaching, he said he had said nothing in secret. And so we should, in taking this to the principle of modesty, we should have not kept any secrets with the opposite gender that is not obviously a spouse that if we were put on trial for we could not have a third party that uh, could testify and say that there was uh, nothing meant there 
Okay, in summary, uh, we learned that we should flee lustful practices, not try to get as close to the edge as possible, so we should stay far away. We talked about lasciviousness, that it's practices that lead into sin, including things like flirting or dancing or impure words and impure actions. And these should be avoided by Christians. We learned we should avoid the behavior of a harlot in its many forms. Uh, we talked about how Christians especially should never flatter others, especially those of the opposite gender. And we learned that secret keeping with the opposite gender that is not a spouse is both dangerous and doesn't avoid the appearance of evil. And in everything, we are to avoid the appearance of evil. That is the biggest principle in modesty and uh, behavior, is in everything we do, we should avoid the appearance of evil. So, to close, let's end with a word of prayer. Dear Jesus, thank you for all these things you have taught us. Please be with us and help us to be able to apply these things to our lives. Help us to draw closer to you and to show modesty in our behavior. Help us to be pure in everything we say and do. And help us to help others get ready for heaven. Thank you for hearing and answering our prayer. Amen.